you told me one year ago to make Pac-Man in Minecraft, I probably would have said, nah, too complicated. But as someone who grew up loving this game, and someone who's running out of project ideas, I decided to give it an honest try. And over the past month, I not only finished it, but it ended up being one of the most fun and uniquely challenging projects I've ever made. You're gonna love this video. This is how I made Pac-Man with just redstone. Going into this project, I didn't know everything about Pac-Man, but here's what I did know. The player controls Pac-Man with a joystick, moving him up, left, down, or right. At the beginning of a level, there are a bunch of dots. As Pac-Man moves over dots, he eats them and gets points. You can also eat fruit for extra points. If you eat all the dots, you beat the level and move on to the next one. But as you play, there are four ghosts that come out from the center, called the Ghost House. If any of the ghosts touch you, you lose a life. The number of starting lives was actually a setting on the original game, but most of the time it was set to three. So if you die three times, it's game over. There are also these four big dots called power pellets. If Pac-Man eats one, the ghosts turn blue for a short time, and you can eat them for points. After being eaten, a ghost rushes back to the ghost house before chasing you again. This was already a lot to think about, but if I wanted to make this with redstone, I was going to have to learn way more about the specifics of the game. How did the ghosts choose what path to take? When do they leave the ghost house? How does the scoring work? How many levels are there? Pretty soon, I realized that I wasn't going to be able to make a one-to-one -one recreation of the original game. That would be a little bit insane. So to make sure I cover at least the main elements, I decided to make some goals for myself. The map should look and feel the same as the original. There should be dots and power pellets. The ghost behavior should be as accurate as possible. And there should be a scoring system, a live system, and a level system. I thought that if I can at least do all these things, it would be accurate enough to say that I made Pac-Man in Minecraft. The first thing I decided to build in Minecraft was the display. As you guys probably know by now, I typically just use redstone lamps, so I started trying to make the Pac-Man map with just redstone lamps. The original game of Pac-Man is split into 28 by 36 game tiles, so I thought the display should at least be big enough to show Pac-Man in any of these tiles. Technically, Pac-Man can be in more than one tile at once because he moves smoothly from tile to tile, but I wasn't worried about that. As long as I could show Pac-Man in any single game tile, I felt like that was good enough for now. After a bit of playing around, I found that the smallest size for a game tile you could get away with was 3x3, where Pac-Man looks like this. It was also during this time that my girlfriend made some ghost designs for me. She made them four different shapes so that you can tell the four ghosts apart from each other. So with 3x3 game tiles, the display was going to be 84 by 108 blocks. And yeah, that's pretty big, but it's Pac-Man. I knew it was going to be big no matter what. However, as I started to work more on the display, it just didn't feel like Pac-Man. So for the first time in my history of making games, I thought, you know what? This needs a color screen. There are lots of designs for color screens, but I've always thought that this one by my friend Mod Punch Tree looks really good. It uses a texture pack, but I mean, just look how good it looks. It's so clean. So I felt like this would be a really good fit for Pac-Man. But at the time, I didn't really know how it worked. So I just asked Mod for his texture pack, and he was nice enough to send it over. And after a bit of playing around with it myself, I realized it was pretty simple. If you didn't know, you can right click a single redstone dust to turn it into a dot. So this texture pack basically just detects for a dot and applies a new texture face to the front of it. And it can detect for the 16 different signal strengths, giving you 16 different textures to customize. So the logical next step was to find the original Pac-Man sprites online and start changing the textures. I made 0 blank, 1 dot, 2 power pellet, 3 through 7 Pac-Man, 8 through 11 ghosts, 12 blue ghosts, 13 eyes, and 14 through 15 I just reserved for fruits or whatever else I might need later. These sprites already looked 10 times better than redstone lamps, so I was super happy with them. Genuinely, I thought that the only thing that could make this better is if the textures were animated like in the real game, but that didn't seem possible. And then I thought, wait a minute, lava is animated, and so is prismarine. Actually, there's a ton of blocks that have animated textures, so maybe they actually can be animated. I immediately went online to figure out how to do this. I messed with JSON files, MC Meta files, I think I spent more time with the Minecraft files than I ever have before. And after like three hours of trial and error, I had this. Fully animated textures. Now, Pac-Man looks like he's actually eating something, and the legs of the ghost make it look like they're running around. And what's really cool is that the speed of the animation is not affected by the tick rate. You can speed up the game with Carpet Mod and it'll still look perfect. One thing to note here is that in the original game, the eyes of the ghosts look in the direction that they're moving. 
but I didn't have enough signal strengths to do that, because 4 faces times 4 ghosts is already 16 values. And you can't do it with animated textures either, because it's not a repeating pattern. It depends on how the ghost is moving. So that's why I just photoshopped all the ghost's eyes to the middle. It looked pretty creepy at first, but I got used to it. The other amazing thing about using signal strengths is that they're really easy to work with. As soon as I finished the sprites, I built this circuit, which generates a signal strength of 3 and moves it along these dusts. And as you can see, it looked incredible. Of course, this wasn't the final display, I still needed to make all the walls and all that stuff, but I wasn't super worried about that, so I just saved that problem for later. Next, I wanted to get Pac-Man moving around on the screen. Since joysticks don't exist in Minecraft, I made four pressure plates for the player to use. This makes it relatively easy to use WASD on your keyboard. To keep track of where Pac-Man is, I decided to give him an X coordinate and a Y coordinate and store them in these vertical registers. For example, right now the stored coordinates are 3, 5, because this is 3 in binary and this is 5 in binary. Then to move Pac-Man left or right, I made a circuit to either add one or subtract one from the X register. And to move him up and down, I made the same circuit on the Y register. So now he can move in all four directions. Then, to convert these coordinates to an actual position on the screen, I use something called a matrix decoder. You can learn more about these in this video right here, but basically, they just take an XY coordinate and convert it to a real location. So if I plug in 3, 5 to the matrix decoder, then this torch lights up, which is 3 over and 5 up. However, I knew that this wasn't going to be enough for Pac-Man, because it just plots a binary value, on or off. Pac-Man has four different values for the four different sprites. I needed a way to both decode the position and make sure it's the correct sprite on the screen. So I made four matrix decoders, each responsible for a unique direction. For example, if you use this decoder, it'll plot the left Pac-Man. But if you use this decoder, it'll plot the right Pac-Man. And then I made it so that only the decoder with the most recent direction is enabled. This ensured that Pac-Man would always be facing the right way. Once that was done, I hooked up the pressure plates, and just like that, I could move Pac-Man around on the screen. It looked amazing, and it was surprisingly fast. When I sped up the game with Carpet Mod, it felt like there was no delay, which is pretty rare for a redstone build. I was actually so impressed with this that I called my friend Sloimy to show him. He thought it was really cool, but he also told me there's a much better way to do this. Apparently, there's a such thing as a signal strength matrix decoder. It takes in an XY coordinate and a signal strength, and it just puts that strength at that coordinate. For example, if you put in the coordinate 2, 4, and you put in a strength of 7, you can see that it puts a 7 at that coordinate. I had no idea this existed, but it was exactly what I needed, because now I could just use one decoder instead of four. All I had to do was put the most recent direction into the signal strength value right here. This made the build way smaller and faster. Thanks, Sloimy. Next, I wanted to make Pac-Man start eating some dots. If you only had a single tile, then this would be really easy. Remember, a dot is just signal strength 1, so if Pac-Man comes into this tile, then the 1 gets overwritten and it looks like he ate it. But when you have more than one tile, the dots will just come right back. I needed a circuit to remember which dots are eaten. In my opinion, the simplest way to do that was with an SR latch for every dot. When a dot hasn't been eaten yet, the latch is in the reset state. Then when Pac-Man comes along, he sets the latch, which tells the screen there's no dot anymore. If he comes to this tile again, he's going to try to set the latch again, but that's fine, the latch is already set. And as you can see, this worked really well. SR latches were definitely the way to go. Also, dots should add 10 points whenever you eat them, so I thought this was a good time to put in that functionality. I stole a counter design, and I made it count up by 10 points whenever any latch became set. I also retextured it to be black and white so that it fits in better with the rest of the screen. And now, I could move Pac-Man around, eat dots, and I could see the score going up by 10 every time. Beautiful. Next, I finally got around to making the walls of the game. The first thing I tried was to draw the walls with blocks. This looked okay, but I wasn't super happy with it. So then I tried making the walls with my texture pack instead. After analyzing all the game tiles that have a wall, I realized that there are only 24 different kinds. And when I heard 24, it reminded me of how note blocks have 24 different notes that you can set them to. So after about an hour and more messing with files, I had this. All 24 wall tiles on a single note block. This made it really easy to make the walls. I just put note blocks on every wall tile and set them all to the correct patterns by spamming right click. By the way, I ended up making the display 29 by 36 instead of 28 by 36. That way Pac-Man could be centered. I thought you guys would appreciate that. Once all the walls were in place, it finally looked like Pac-Man. Seeing him eat the dots and move around on the real map was a great feeling. But then came the annoying part, collision detection. As the game stands, if you turn Pac-Man into the wall, he just goes into it. 
no problem. He doesn't even know they exist. So I needed to figure out how to detect for walls and make sure that the player can't force Pac-Man through them. My first idea for this was to just have a giant ROM that stores the information about every tile. You would input a coordinate and it would tell you which sides cause a collision. For example, if you input 14.9, it would output up and down. But as I thought about it more, I felt like a giant ROM would be too big. It needed to store 4 bits for every single playable location. So I played around with the idea of optimizing it to make it smaller. For example, if you want to store the collision information for this segment, you can take advantage of the fact that they all have the same Y value. Just check to see if Y is this, and if X is within this range, and if so, output up and down. But then I thought about it even more, and I was like, why am I optimizing this? It's going to be big no matter what, and it's not going to be the slowest component. So I stopped worrying about optimizations, and I just got to work making the ROM. This was extremely tedious, and it was probably the most annoying thing to make in this entire project. But it was so worth it. When I tried it out for the first time, it felt magical that the game knew about the walls. I don't even know how to describe it, it just added an entirely new level of realism to the game. Next, it was finally time to put in the most central part of Pac-Man, the ghosts. I'm just gonna spoil it right now, putting in these ghosts ended up being more challenging than everything I've done so far combined. But you know what helps me solve challenges? The sponsor of this video, Brilliant. Just like Redstone, Brilliant is a platform that makes learning computer science enjoyable. After taking a short quiz, Brilliant will match you with content that fits your needs, whether you're brand new to computer science or you already have a PhD. There are thousands of interactive lessons, and if you ever get stuck, there are hints to help you get back on track. I really like them because they care about actually learning and not just memorizing things. For example, in the new Thinking with Code course, you'll write an app navigation program yourself instead of just watching someone do it. You can get started free for 30 days, and the first 200 people to use my sign-up link get 20% off an annual plan. Just go to brilliant.org slash mapatwings. Before getting into any of the redstone for ghosts, let's talk about what I learned from my research about how they actually work. There are four ghosts in the game of Pac-Man. Blinky, Pinky, Inky, and Clyde. At all times, every ghost has something called a target tile. You can think of this as a tile on the map that the ghost is trying to get to. Now, ghosts are always in one of three possible modes. Scatter mode, chase mode, or frighten mode. And the ghost's target tiles will change based on what mode they're in. In scatter mode, every ghost has a fixed target tile, each of which is in a different corner of the map. So all the ghosts will scatter to the corners as they try to reach their targets. In chase mode, the target tiles are not fixed. They take Pac-Man's location into account. This is the quote normal mode because the ghosts are trying to chase Pac-Man. The exact way that the target tiles are calculated gets a little bit complicated though, so I'll tell you more about that later. And finally, Frighten Mode is when the ghosts turn blue. They move slower and they can be eaten by Pac-Man. Frighten Mode is unique because it's the only time that ghosts don't have a specific target tile. Instead, they randomly decide which turn to make at every intersection. You could also argue that there's a fourth mode, called Eaten, which happens whenever a ghost gets eaten by Pac-Man. They turn into a pair of eyes and go back to the ghost house. So why are these modes a thing? I mean, it's pretty clear why Frighten Mode is a thing, that happens whenever Pac-Man eats a power pellet, but what's the point of having Chase Mode and Scatter Mode? Well, the creators of Pac-Man wanted the game to have a wave effect, where the ghosts chase you for a bit, and then relax, and then chase you more, and then relax, etc. Specifically, on the first level of the game, this is how it works. There are these four waves of Scatter Mode and Chase Mode before staying in Chase Mode for the rest of the level. If the ghosts enter Frighten Mode, the game just pauses the timer and continues where it left off whenever Frighten Mode ends. After level 1, these wave timings change to make the levels get harder and harder. When I read about all this, I'll be honest, I wasn't super concerned with having these exact waves in my game. I felt like as long as Chase Mode and Scatter Mode switch between each other in some way, then that would be good enough. Especially because if you speed up the game with mods, the timings are going to get messed up anyways. 7 seconds at tick rate 20 is only a quarter of a second at tick rate 500. But at the very least, I was very set on having all three modes in my game. So how did the ghosts attempt to reach their target tiles? Well, they only think one step at a time. Before every movement, a ghost will calculate the distance from the target tile to all four of its adjacent tiles. You can think of this as the ghost ranking the different directions that it could move with a number. If there are walls in the way, then those directions are not considered. And unlike Pac-Man, ghosts cannot turn 180 degrees. So the opposite direction of whatever it did last time is not considered either. With whatever directions are remaining, a ghost will choose the one with the smallest distance. If there's a tie between distances, then the ghost will just use this ordering for preference. And this entire process is recalculated every movement. 
So let's look at this in action. I'm gonna zoom in to Blinky during scatter mode. Right now he's moving up and he's about to reach this intersection. At this intersection, he calculates these four distances. Up is a wall, so that's not considered, and down would mean doing a 180 because he was just going up, so that's not considered either. Between left and right, right has the shorter distance, so that's the direction he'll take. Then he's gonna continue to go right until he reaches this intersection. How do I know he's gonna do that? Because he has walls on up and down, and he can't go left because that would be a 180. The only choice is to keep going right. In fact, even when he gets to this intersection, he still only has one choice. Now the walls are up and right, and he still can't go left because of the 180 thing, so he has to go down. The next time a decision is actually made is here. At this intersection, he needs to make a choice between left and down. Left has a smaller distance, so he'll take that. And finally, at this intersection, he needs to decide between up, left, and down. Up has the smallest distance, so he chooses that, and the cycle continues. A similar thing is happening to all the ghosts during scatter mode. They're all using the same algorithm and getting stuck in some kind of loop. Okay, now let's go back to chase mode and talk about how those target tiles are calculated. This is the central part of the ghost's AI. It's what gives the ghosts their unique personalities. Starting with Blinky, his target tile during chase mode is just Pac-Man himself. This makes Blinky pretty scary because he tends to take a direct path to Pac-Man. Next, we have Pinky. Pinky's target tile is four spaces ahead of Pac-Man. This makes Pinky feel like an ambusher because he's trying to aim for where Pac-Man will be in the future. So this is where the target is when Pac-Man is facing left, facing down, and facing right. When Pac-Man is facing up, the target was intended to be here, but the original game actually has an overflow bug which causes it to be four spaces up and four spaces left. I'll put a better explanation for why this happens in the description if you're interested. Next up is Inky. Inky's target tile is probably the most complicated. To find Inky's target tile, you first need to find an intermediate tile that is two spaces ahead of Pac-Man. If Pac-Man is facing up, it's also two spaces to the left because of that same bug from before. Then draw a line from Blinky to that tile and double the length of that line. Wherever the end of it lands, that's Inky's target tile. The idea behind this was to make Inky and Blinky work together to trap Pac-Man. As Blinky chases Pac-Man from behind, Inky tends to be waiting for him on the other side. For this reason, I tend to think Inky is the smartest ghost. Lastly, we have Clyde. You can already tell from the name that Clyde is a little bit special. When Clyde is more than eight tiles away from Pac-Man, his target tile is Pac-Man himself. But when he's less than eight tiles away, his target tile is the same as the one in scatter mode, all the way in the bottom left corner. This makes him get close to Pac-Man and then change his mind. I don't think there's any 200 IQ strategy behind this. Clyde just has some commitment issues. So yeah, that's most of the information about how the ghosts work. In summary, they're just minimizing their distance to a target tile, and that target tile changes based on whether it's chase mode or scatter mode. And if Pac-Man needs a power pellet, there's no target tiles, and they take random directions until frightened mode is over. Keep in mind, I'm leaving out a lot of the small details here, but this is the heart of the AI. And in terms of redstone, this is what I decided to prioritize most before adding anything else. After doing all that research, I'm not gonna lie, I was feeling pretty overwhelmed. These ghosts have a lot to them. So instead of thinking about all the ghosts at once, I started off by pretending that only Blinky exists. I thought this was a smart thing to do because chances are once I'm done with Blinky, I'll be able to duplicate a lot of the hardware for the other ghosts. So I got to work making a decoder for Blinky and another set of XY registers to store his coordinates. Then I decided that the next best thing to attack was the distance calculations. I wanted to create a circuit that takes in a ghost XY and a target XY and calculates the four distances. To do this calculation, I had to use some geometry. Since the distances are straight lines, you can view each one as forming a right triangle like this. The length on the bottom of the triangle is the difference between the two x values, which I'll call dx. And the side of the triangle is the difference between the y values, which I'll call dy. Then using the Pythagorean theorem, I knew that the distance I wanted squared is equal to dx squared plus dy squared. Taking a square root on both sides gave me the final formula for distance. At first, I was really annoyed by this because I didn't want to do a square root with redstone. Square roots are way more annoying than something like addition or subtraction. But then I realized, since I'm just comparing distances, I don't have to take the square root. If you compare a squared and b squared, and you find out that a squared is bigger, then a has to be bigger than b. So I decided to just calculate the square distances instead. It doesn't change which distance is the smallest, and it avoids the square root. Back in Minecraft, I started to work on a layout for this machine before building anything. It had four multipliers and a bunch of adders and subtractors. But then I was like, really? 
four multipliers for one ghost? That meant that there's going to be 16 multipliers in total, which seemed crazy to me. Don't get me wrong, the layout was correct, but I was skeptical about whether or not this is the best way to do it. And sure enough, after a bit of playing around, I optimized the layout to use two multipliers instead of four. I know that doesn't sound like much, but this creates way less lag when the game is running. Then I went ahead and built this thing for real. This took about eight hours and it should not have taken that long at all. I kept having issues with overflow and converting to negative numbers and there were just a lot of stupid problems. But I got it done and this is what the final machine looked like. Here's the input, which is just the ghost position and the target position. And here's the output, which is the four square distances. So for example, if I make the ghost position one three and the target position eight five, then it outputs 40, 58, 68, and 50. Now that I had the four distances, the next step was to choose the smallest one. I spent an embarrassingly long time trying to figure out the best way to do this. Eventually though, I decided to use this bracket formation. The four distances go in here, and the smallest distance should come out here. Each of these boxes do the same thing. They just output the lower of the two values. So for example, if I put in four, two, three, and one, then this box chooses two, this box chooses one, and the final box chooses one. And if any of the directions are invalid, like a wall, I made them have a really big distance before going into the bracket. That way there's no way it can win. And with that, the ghost decision maker was done. Putting in those same positions from earlier, you can see that it chooses 40, which is the smallest one. Then I took this whole thing and I hooked it up to the screen to get Blinky moving. I made his target tile 14.9 and I made a copy of the collision ROM for him so that he, you know, doesn't hit a wall. When I tried it out for the first time, it did not work. Not even close. Turns out there were still a bunch of bugs in my distance calculators, which was really annoying because I thought I was done with those after the 8 hours I spent earlier. But once those were fixed, Blinky correctly moved to the target tile. I think I actually jumped out of my chair when this happened. I was so excited. At this point in the project, I felt confident enough to build all the ghosts instead of just Blinky. I made 3 more decoders, XY coordinates, collision ROMs, and ghost decision makers. And amazingly, all 4 ghosts worked perfectly. No matter what tiles I gave the ghosts, they all did exactly what they were supposed to. I was so happy with how well everything was coming together. It really started to feel like Pac-Man. But of course, I still had a lot of work to do. Most importantly, I still had to make all three of the ghosts modes. Scatter mode seemed conceptually the easiest, so that's what I started with. Remember, in scatter mode, every ghost has a fixed target tile. So I just put in some wiring to activate those fixed target tiles. I tested it by letting it run for a long time, and sure enough, all four ghosts got caught in the correct loops. Then I worked on chase mode. Remember, this is when all the ghosts have different target tiles, so I had to build something different for every ghost. Starting with Blinky, he was actually really easy. I just took the Pac-Man coordinates and plugged them in. For Pinky, I made this circuit to calculate the position four tiles in front of Pac-Man. For example, if Pac-Man is at 3, 4, and the direction is right, then the target tile is 7, 4. And yes, I put in the bug when Pac-Man is facing up. That's what this repeater right here is for. Then for Inky, I made this circuit. Remember, Inky's target tile is found by drawing a line from Blinky to an intermediate tile and doubling it. And although this sounds like a lot of math, I ended up deriving a really simple equation for it. Inky's target tile is just two times the intermediate XY minus Blinky's XY. The best way for me to explain why this works is with vectors. Imagine that these two positions are vectors starting at 0, 0 and landing on the respective coordinates. Doubling the intermediate xy gives you a new vector that looks like this. Then subtracting Blinky's xy is the same thing as taking Blinky's vector, spinning it 180 degrees, and putting it tip to tail with this one. And as you can see, the spot that it lands on is Inky's target tile. So this circuit is literally just following that equation. It calculates the intermediate value, doubles it, and subtracts Blinky. Then for Clyde, I made a circuit to detect for when he's more than 8 tiles away from Pac-Man. This required another distance calculation, and once again, I avoided a square root. I just detected for when the square distance is more than 64, which is equivalent to the distance being more than 8. Once these circuits were all hooked up, chase mode was done. And now that I had scatter mode and chase mode, I made a timer to switch between them. Instead of doing the complicated wave timings from the original game, I just made it switch between them every 32 frames. This felt like a good way to do it. Finally, I worked on Frighten Mode. I put in the four power pellets, and I made a circuit to detect for when Pac-Man eats them. I also made them add 50 points to the score. Then, to create random turns, I took a bit of a different approach than the original game. In the original game, the ghosts use a random number generator, and they don't have a target tile. 
but in my game, I kept target tiles enabled, and I just continuously randomized them to one of the four corners of the game. This was not a perfect alternative. I realized halfway through building it that it introduces some bias, but it was much easier to do it this way, and I don't think it's super noticeable when you play. Once that was done, I put in circuits to make frightened ghosts get slowed down. Specifically, I made them run at half the speed of Pac-Man, which made them much easier to chase down. Then, I put in circuits to detect for when Pac-Man eats a ghost. This was done by comparing Pac-Man's coordinates to all the other ghosts. If any of them are the same as Pac-Man, then Pac-Man must be eating that ghost. From there, I made sure that any ghost that gets eaten has their sprite turned into eyes and their target tile set back to the ghost house. And I also made it add points to the score when you eat them. Once they get to the ghost house, they turn back into their original sprite and go back to whatever mode they were in previously. And that's pretty much all the logic I made for Frighten Mode. It's also worth mentioning that in the original game, the eyes are really fast. They literally zoom back to the ghost house. But I had no way of doing that. Going to the ghost house takes just as many calculations as going anywhere else, so unfortunately the eyes didn't get any speed boost. Other than that though, Frighten Mode was pretty accurate. With all three modes done, the game really started to take shape. But there was one thing missing before you could play a game. Death detection. Since I hadn't done that yet, Pac-Man was still invincible. So to detect for a death, I reused the same circuit from Fright Mode to see if Pac-Man has the same coordinates as any of the other ghosts. If he does, and it's not Fright Mode, then he must have hit a ghost and died. And since I had some extra room on my texture pack, I added the death animation from the original game. Unfortunately, this didn't always look good, because animated textures don't necessarily start at the beginning. Depending on when you die, the animation starts from a different place. So sometimes it looks amazing, and other times not so much. But it's still really cool, and I'm really glad I put it in my game. Then I put in a live system. I used a binary counter to store the number of lives, and count down whenever you lose one. It starts at 3 lives, and if it gets to 0, the game stops. And just like the original game, I made a lives indicator on the bottom left. At this point, I was so close to being done. The last thing on my checklist was the level system. In the original game, the first 21 levels become increasingly difficult, mainly because they get faster. And then from level 21 onwards, every level is essentially the same. However, I decided to make all the levels the same from the very beginning. No changes to the speed or anything. I did this because the max speed of my game was already horribly slow, so I didn't want to make the lower levels even slower. I got to work, and after just a few hours, I had a fully working level system. This ended up being a lot more complicated than I thought it was going to be, and I was really proud of it. Here's me beating level 1 for the first time. You can see that when I eat the last dot, the game pauses for a second, resets the map, and goes to level 2. Also, if you didn't know, the original game has somewhat of a final level. At level 256, there's an overflow error, and the screen gets really messed up. So this is considered to be the end of Pac-Man. I really, really wanted to include this in my game, but it just wasn't possible. The screen is a bunch of note blocks, and note blocks can only be changed by a player clicking them. So that was a bit disappointing. But overall, I couldn't be too mad at this. The level system was still really cool. This project was a massive success. The only main thing I didn't include was the fruit, and that was because I literally ran out of sprites. Once I added the death animation and the lives on the bottom, all 16 signal strengths were taken. But I still hit all of my original goals, the game looks fantastic, and it's genuinely fun to play. I'm really happy with the final result. I'll see you in the showcase. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe, and if you'd like to support me, I have a Patreon page in the description. I also have a Redstone Discord server, so come join us if that sounds interesting. I hope you learned something, I hope you enjoyed. Peace out guys.